Hello everybody, welcome to another live stream with Bismarck. Hello. And this time we talk about our impressions of the Dunkirk movie. And yeah, here we have the presentation going. It's rather short in this case. It works. So I think let's see how, how do we start? I, I would say let's begin at the beginning of the movie. Yeah. Does this sound good to you? Yeah, excellent. So well, what I particularly like right in the beginning of the movie, you have basically no idea what is going on. You are brought right into basically on the same line as the soldiers, the British soldiers. It's basically the whole movie is from the British perspective. And and this is this I, I liked a lot because in in most computer games and also in movies you always have this almost total information. You always know what's going on. And for instance you have a map or everything. You you know where the enemy is, where it's shooting from, where it's coming from, which color he has, or you see the battlefield from above, or you know other stuff. And this movie basically completely abandons that. It's just, I think it states in three or four lines that the Allies were in a pocket and the Germans were driving closer. And then you see those soldiers and, and they try to I think one tries to take a dump, the other one takes a smoke, and suddenly they're attacked, but you don't see from where. And this drives this uncertainty and and the whole the whole aspect of you you don't know what's going on really well, which I personally liked a lot. Yeah, it's 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 kind of the, the theme of the movie. I mean there's some beautifully shot sequences and there is quite some so moments where you you feel like you're inside the scene. Um, now I will say, of course, uh, if anybody is watching this that have, has not seen the movie, um, for spoilers, if you know what happens at Dunkirk, you don't have to worry about what we're talking about. But we're going to talk about specific scenes. But really, um, if if you know what happened at Dunkirk, which I'm sure you, all of you guys do, you're not going to miss anything. There is no story, as to say. But to go back to 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 what's really you know what you mentioned here with the with that beginning scene. It's actually interesting because my, my girlfriend after the movie, she's like, oh, you know, in that beginning scene, that's like one of the first times in a movie that I felt like I was inside the scene walking with those soldiers. Now, I granted, we watched it in IMAX and one of the biggest screens in Europe. Um, so that obviously helped that sensation as well, since this movie was essentially shot for IMAX. Um, and it, it, it really had those those scenes that that made you feel like you're inside and what you said also that there is this in enigmatic enemy like you never see the Ger germans you, you i mean you see the planes uh and then at the end you see them the blurred of, faces yeah, the blurred, but blurred. blurred yeah so it, it always feels like you know that there's that extra part of well, suspense and uh, in a way it, like the, this being scared of something you know is out there but you just don't see it. it it's, it's, in a sense, it's a, it draws a little bit, I guess, on the horror genre, where you have those scenes where you know something is there, but you just don't know where they are. And then suddenly stuff happens. And um, I think that that part of the movie, the way they use scenes, and the way they set up, um, set up the scenes and the way they also set up the Germans is actually helpful. Uh, yeah. It's minimalistic, but it, 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 it somehow works. Yeah, I, I really like that part. And, and the other thing what I really liked is, is the characters. The characters, they all, they, there is no Superman in there. There is no archetypical hero. It's like they all have their, their flaws, their pains, their hopes, and, and uh, the desperation and everything is in there. And, and sometimes they make, we would say, good decisions and sometimes bad decisions. I think the, the boy on, or the, the two boys on the, on the on the little ship are uh, I think the best example when when in later on he, he rises to the occasion and, and tells the the one veteran basically a lie but in this case a lie that w spares him more pain whereas before he didn't do this and you can see yeah. this character development and and other characters don't develop in this way so it's it's not this 
this everyone it's a happy ending or something but it's it's clearly it's about sacrifice and and growing and understanding and and getting a perspective i, I really like that part also yeah well one of the things one of the scenes that really particularly struck me and I, I might be superimposing here something that wasn't even meant by the director but there is that of course that one scene where the spitfire ditches and you you see the pilot well initially you don't see the pilot struggling to get out because you see it from the perspective of the other spitfire pilot which happens to be uh, who, who happens to be tom hardy and you see the ditch spitfire and you see a hand waving in the in the cockpit and tom hardy looks down and he waves back thinking that you know my wingman is telling me everything is all right turns out 10 minutes later we see the perspective from the wingman and this is not what's going on. He's panicking. His canopy only opens one way, and he's trying to push it. And that's, that's, that's the hand waving. And those scenes happen quite a few times in that movie. And that's also one of the reasons why I want to rewatch that movie, because there are so many scenes that I feel have quite uh, an intelligent thought process behind it. And it, it pays off in, in my sense. You know, in, in, there, There's a lot of detail, and I said this in the, in the video as well that I made. There's a lot of detail in, in small doses that show that a lot of thought was put into those sequences. And maybe, you know, this specific scene, well, like I said, I'm superimposing something that wasn't meant or it's just my interpretation of things. But it kind of, you know, makes me feel like, you know, that that really, that is really something they wanted to show. Yeah, I mean, this is an excellent point because I didn't notice it. Now that you mentioned it, I remember, I think there was a scene where I, I could see the guy waving from Ditched uh, Spitfire, but uh, yeah. I have actually forgot it. And and I I mean I I watched a few I'm a huge Christopher Nolan fan and for instance I watched Batman Begins several times, and once you read a little bit more into psychology, it's quite interesting to watch the movie again because there are certain lines in there that really strike quite deep, which a lot of people I think miss. So I wouldn't be surprised if in this case he did it on the visuals. And not with with the dialogue because the dialogue in this movie and rightfully so I think is rather sparse. So so and and I think he he I think he mainly tried to create um, a visual and also an auditorial um, masterpiece or or let's not masterpiece a piece of art more in this case, and less the traditional like. Um, funny lines or, or what I think in sometimes he did in Batman, very deep lines that have quite a lot of meaning behind them. In this case, he went less on the, on the, on the verbal level, but more on the visual and audio level. Yeah, they, they, I mean, there is not a lot of dialogue in the movie, which is probably, in, in my opinion, is a strong point. Like yeah. I've seen people criticize that and I can understand where they're coming from. Um, it's 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 certainly not a movie of the traditional sense. I've said you know I've heard people say that it was boring, and it's probably boring for those people because they imagined a a quote unquote war movie as we are used to, uh, so, you know something with maybe snarky dialogues, um, or if it's a more intelligent intelligent approach, still more dialogue, more uh, character development, and so on. And I, as you said, there was not a lot of character development. In my opinion, that's a good part in this movie because it really is trying to show specific scenes and yes the scale this is something that people have been also been saying you know the scale of the movie is not what dunkirk would probably have been like the, there's a lot of people on the beach but there's not as much people on the beach as we always think um and as some of the pictures for example show us but we still get that authentic feeling of an evacuation being in progress and you know that first scene where he comes uh, when the quote well it's not really the protagonist but one of the main characters of the movie uh, comes out to the beach and he sees all those lines and he wants to join them and he realizes you know this one is for this regiment this one is for this regiment and he can't find his own people probably and then he finds alternative ways to trying to get himself into safety and he nearly does a couple of times um so there is not a lot of dialogue needed in that sense and in in the moments where there is a lot of dialogue it's it's usually uh, well, Ivor on the little ship, of course. And then there is that longish dialogue when they are in that uh, little uh, beach ship and they're trying to decide who has to get off and who, who can stay. And, and and you can see that, you know, in that dialogue, uh, tempers are flaring very fast. Yeah. Which is somewhat strange because you don't want your movie to be you know, just people screaming and so on. But in that specific scene, even though it takes a long time in the movie, 
um, it, it kind of works. Yeah, it makes it, it. It also makes total sense. There's no, there's, there's no emotion in the in the movie. I would say that that's unneeded or no situation that is like like in a way forced. I mean, except for for one final scene, but we talk yeah. about this later. So, this is. Um, I don't think you you need a lot of dialogue, and 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 this is I think where he probably made made a major progression because I mean okay. I, th I think he's probably not the first one who did this, but let's let's face it, a movie is first and foremost a visual p piece yes. of art or a visual medium, and and I, th I think he 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 nailed that pretty much because if you want to have a lot of text, well, read a book. <laughs> that's that's my approach usually. So this this whole, I think he. He showed with, uh, with how little you can do very much in case of the dialogue. And and the next thing is I think the the audio because I think you you really noted that in I think in our flight or something that you you really like the the shots. I mean, for for instance, I think the the machine gun fire from the from the Heinkels against the Spitfire or something, I think it, it felt more like machine gun, for, uh, machine cannons, more like 20 or 30 mil shots. I think they were too loud in a way, but actually quite fitting for for getting the impression along, I think. Well, in a way, I mean, you can always say, since you see that scene essentially from Tom Hardy's perspective, who is the Spitfire pilot, you can always make the argument, well, we shouldn't be hearing those shots. And we should only be seeing or hearing the impacts slash hearing um, the bullets maybe whiz past. But obviously, it's not it's not just a visual experience; it's also an audio uh, or a sound effect experience. And yes, that you know that Heinkel seems to have a twenty mil, which is t from the time frame uh, not one hundred percent accurate, probably. Um, but then you can also make the argument maybe it's just the way. That it would feel like to yeah, an I think attacking pilot. Th right? I think this was he wanted to 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 convey the feeling. So I don't have yes. a problem with it because it, it was clearly boom 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 boom, and, and it yeah. was like eh, that doesn't sound right. But I, I think it, it it's more about the impression, and this is the thing, the, the key point. The movie is trying to get an impression along, and you can f feel entertained by an uh, impression or not. But it's, I think, mainly about an impression, and and I think this is what I like with an impression because an impression is very subjective in any way. So he's he's this is also the reason why I, I in this case I don't go for 100% historical accuracy because first it's a movie and also it's it's about dealing an impression and what lasts with people and we know that that people like have the impression like the the RAF wasn't there on the beaches, which we know from, from documents and everything, this is wrong. But those people that were there on the, on the beach, of course, get the impression that the RAF wasn't there because they were fighting somewhere else to prevent the Luftwaffe from getting to the beaches all along. Yeah. Sorry, I just um, replied to, to a question in chat. Um, yeah, it's 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 the impression I think, and this is probably why it's a movie that you should really should watch a couple of times, because you want to go through the movie, go through the scenes, and see you know what kind of and we've already said this, so I'm not gonna dwell too long on it, but what kind of um, ideas and what kind of perspectives and what kind of feelings are supposed to be conveyed during those moments, and while it might not be 100% realistic. Um, for example, you know, when the Stukas attack, and this is early in the beginning, you only see three Stukas attacking. But you also see that kind of out of the perspective of this one soldier. So maybe, in a sense, you can argue, well, there were more Stukas, but he only really saw those three Stukas that were coming straight for him. Um, and in, 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 that, in that sense, what you say, the movie does a lot with little. There are moments where I would say uh, that it kind of rips you out slightly out of the experience for example in that in that end when you see the spitfire gliding you see dunkirk in the background and obviously since they don't use cgi or not that much cgi it looks like a very modern version of dunkirk because it is the modern version of of, of dunkirk or the way it looks i'm not quite sure if they really filmed it on the beaches of dunkirk but 
it, it, it looks more like a modern city than it that I would imagine it to have been um, 70 years ago, 70, 80 years ago. Um, but it, it still conveys that authenticity. Yeah? Maybe not 100% realistic, but it still conveys that authenticity. And that's, I think, one of the strong points of this movie. It's It feels authentic. It makes mistakes. It gets away with things um, that other movies might not get away with, but it is authentic. Yeah, and I think the, the point with few Stukas actually makes it better to a certain degree of course it's less historically accurate in this way but you are not overloaded and this is the yeah. thing in 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 typical Bayham like Transformers you you are basically overloaded with with everything moving everything turning and turning the camera turning around the bomb that turns in the other way and something I mean this, this is also a way to express something but you're always overloaded visually and and you basically you can't take a breath and the impression and the feeling can't sink in. And this is something, I think, what happens at, in the movie Dunkirk. A lot of the stuff has time to sink in. It can settle down, the dust clears up, and then then it, it, it creates a lasting impression. It's not like, I, I would say Transformers is like drinking uh, a Coke or something. And and Dunkirk is more like a three or four for uh, part meal. So it, it takes longer. It, it, of course, it's in comparison to a Coke, it's, it's quite boring for some people. But the, the meal in the end makes you, I would say, makes you full. Yeah. And, and has a more lasting experience. So, so in, in this way, this was, I mean, this is just a thought. Maybe this was also a reason why did used so little Stuckers and others. I mean, of course, another problem is they used mainly, as far as I know, um, real aircraft and model planes and used as less CGI as possible. Yeah. But I assume this was probably a mixture between, okay, let's let's work with the limits and let's make the best out of the limits because sometimes if you have limits, you actually create something new or better than you would create if you have everything. Yeah, because I, I, this is actually... You know, especially with with the aircraft. I mean, the, some of these aircraft are real artifacts, right? I think they had about three Spitfires. Um, they had, I believe, two Spanish 109s. And those are pretty rare to find at this point. And obviously, you have to be careful that you don't wreck those during the filming. And in that sense, obviously, that's an, this is something that, that has been mentioned before, is you know that the risk of using these aircraft is ext extremely high and you don't want to unnecessary um g well go into an unnecessary risk and, and try to make something special or bombastic where you can find other ways of trying to convey a sense of authenticity and this is actually something i, I is i had somebody tell me the other day is that there are um of course uh, severe stipulation of what you can do with all those old um, planes and what you can't over civilian airspace and I don't know how much uh, permissions they had from, from the governing organization where they filmed but for example apparently in the United Kingdom doing aileron rolls or barrel rolls is, uh, is essentially forbidden um, now I'm personally not a, a civilian pilot I don't know if this is true uh, but apparently a couple of year, uh, years ago at some air show it was done and the pilot and the organizers got into severe trouble just because a barrel roll was made. And obviously, if you have those stipulations by law, you can always get an exception for a movie, uh, which is going to be you know, costing you a lot also in health and safety. And you can always think about, you know, let's just not make a barrel roll and try another way to convey that feeling. Yeah, especially in case of a barrel roll and not using CGI, you probably would have to do a, a plane, a barrel roll with another plane nearby. And yeah. since a barrel roll really is quite um, a problematic maneuver in it itself and also breaks the plane very much down, the, the chances that the shot gets probably wrong is also pretty high. So there's a yeah. lot of risk and everything involved. I mean, if you look at movies and and sometimes at the commentary or something and they say, yeah, and, and this day we shoot that scene and another one. And this is usually just short dialogue scenes or something. And I don't want to imagine how, how long you shoot 
the scenes where planes fly by and everything, how much takes you do, you you make and everything else. I mean, could be that they just okay one take and it's done, but uh, I I guess not. So there's uh, also a, a lot of resources involved and a lot of danger probably too. Yeah. Yeah. Now that we actually you know when when we're talking about aerial combat and dialogue. Um, let me just put those two together and, and, and just quickly talk about the dialogue by the pilots. Now, this is probably also a reason why I think a lot of people think it's a little bit boring, um, or some people think that the movie is a little bit boring, is because you don't have that you know, balls-to-the-wall attitude kind of talk where, you know, let him show, uh, I'll show him a little trick I learned or, <laughs> yeah, yippee ki uh, you, you son of a bee, you know, <laughs> the kind of stuff that you hear in other movies. Um, that didn't happen in this movie. It was literally just, I'm on him, he's on me, I need help, break left, now, and um, what's your fuel, roger that, and so on. It's just, it's completely professional. It is conveying as much information with as little words as possible it's down to earth and it's so much better um than, yeah. than what i i would say you know i mean there's there's other movies like for example top gun right top gun is not it, it has some authenticity to it when it comes because they also use real aircraft but they also have some really sleazy dialogue but for that movie it works yeah but then you have movies like red tails where they have really bad dialogue and they have cgi scenes which are completely over the top and the whole movie just falls apart in this movie, you had, fair enough, you didn't have as much action, quote-unquote, um, or, or traditional or um, popular action as with Red Tails, but you had good action, you had a good suspense throughout the movie, and you had dialogue that was fitting for the moments it was used. Yeah, it, it felt authentic in, in every way. I think that the characters, the action, the, the visuals, it, 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 it gives the, I think, the right on the, on the parent is impression and i think that what he was probably going for and i think it's it's in a way i think it's it's like a bit of detoxing from regular hollywood but at yeah. the same time he had hollywood quality production and this is the, the uh, this is the great combination you don't have the typical hollywood boom bumbling but you have the triple a quality there and, and this is what, what it also makes it great. And, and I think he, he said for quite a while that he, he needed to do the other big movies before he could return to this one because else he w couldn't make it or I think he wouldn't get that much attention. So, so, awesome. so in a way, this, this, this movie probably is, might, might create an, a new wave of better movies or may, maybe it's already the third in line and I didn't notice. This could also be, yeah. But I think this could be a watershed moment away from, from the Bayhem, which, which has its merits on it all. So what, what I, I found quite interesting at first, I think when I saw the three Spitfires, I thought, oh, it's a V formation. I learned this from you. <laughs> <laughs> that back that's then the they, were, they, they were flying the, 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 the V. That, that, that's a V. And around that the Battle of Britain, they already changed to, to the to the four finger four right they started to transition yes yeah. i mean even before the the battle of britain they they started to transition to uh, finger four um but uh slowly and not every squadron it, it was really on um a non uh, institutionalized change in the beginning um and and that's why yeah you have that that, that you have a really beautiful shot of a of a of a, you know a vic formation it's really beautifully done the pilots you know that stellar formation flying whoever whoever was in that pilot seat um it was probably slightly too close for military purposes although they actually stayed very close to each other as well and that's also why the, why the germans called it the idiotenreihe you know row of idiots uh when they saw these formations um, because uh, the tactical flexibility, of course, of, of, of such a formation is pretty bad. And this is actually what you see in the movie, um, even though I think the Germans are not flying as they should, because there's two German 109s that, that, that attack these three uh, Spitfires, and they don't behave like they should. They don't help each other out, and they don't zoom out after their attack, whatever. But you can see that while one Spitfire pilot gets saved by the other, that third one that we don't know about gets shot down. 
And that is obviously the victim of the other uh, 109 that was around there. And if the 109s would have properly communicated and properly flown, they could have potentially shut down all three. But, you know, that's that's a discussion we can have another day, which is nonsensical in this, in this uh, discussion right now. Um, but one, one thing, let me just quickly backtrack. One thing I want to say about the authenticity again is I think the movie's bad scenes, and in my mind there is only one bad scene after yeah. watching it once, are also because you get ripped out of it, the experience, because that scene was so glaringly bad. Right? You have movies... Let me just go back to Red Tails, where the whole, where the whole movie is a train wreck, um, and you don't really see which scene is the worst. Obviously, you have that scene of you know people well, yeah, eat, on, on eating 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 thirty millimeter mine <laughs> shells. <laughs> yeah, you have those those key moments which show how much of a turd that movie is. But it's littered around the countryside essentially. Yeah, it's like a minefield you walk through. With this movie. Um, the, a bad scene sticks out like um you did, know, did uh, your girlfriend notice this is a bad scene that would be interesting yes. okay like even she noticed it but but it, she actually started laughing in the movie okay uh, during that scene that show that tells you how bad it was okay, okay but but you didn't train her in in flight stuff or something um well, I think some things rub off, but uh, to this date, uh, every time I make a video, she tells me, oh, are you talking about a Spitfire? Because the Spitfire is the only plane that she knows. So that's <laughs> that's her level of knowledge right there. Yeah. You know, um, you know that reminds me of, of what you told me in the Slovenian Museum, that that all the, all the guys that once served, they always remember the tank they were um, trained with. So... If they were trained with a Sherman, they refer to every tank as a Sherman. If they were trained with the T-34, they refer to every other tank as a T-34 and the other way. Mm. So basically for, for your girlfriend, she, the first plane she can recognize is a Spitfire and every other plane is a Spitfire as well. Right, yeah. Yeah, pretty much that's, that's how it is. But I mean, like that, that scene was, was terrible bad, you know. It, and the, the thing is, like, because the movie is so good, a scene like that really sticks out. Yeah, that's what I'm what I'm trying to say. Um, yeah, I mean, I, I I don't I think they could have made it a bit different and and still achieved it because the the main problem was he was flying there, gliding there alone over Dunkirk, and then he shot the Spitfire. Uh, then he yes. shot the Sugar down. So if they cut out that part, so maybe it was bad editing. Yeah. So if if they cut out that part before, where is and and then he shots him down and then the, he glides over that, it would per make perfectly sense, I think. Well, it would make more sense. Oh, it made more sense because I think the problem is, can you can you really shoot down a dive bomb by doing a dive? I think that's the main issue. Oh, you can. Um, there is there there are some recorded incidents of it happening. Mostly, it happens by flak, obviously. Um, I mean by plane, of course. So yeah, by, by plane it, it happens. There, there is actually there is one interview on YouTube by a Stuka pilot who says that when they attacked some targets in France or uh, it must have been Dunkirk or something, um, he went into a dive and the Spitfires followed him and the Spitfires were unable to pull out, and two Spitfires crashed into the ground because you know, obviously the Stuka has a way more powerful pullout, yeah, way better uh, um, elevator authority at high speeds and also that um, automatic pullout assist. Um, whereas the Spitfires don't. So he says that there were two Spitfires or something that followed him in a dive or his his uh, his um, his flight and they crashed right into the ground. I mean, you can shoot down something in a dive, absolutely, but the amount of time you have is extremely limited. And the way they did it with that guy who flies past the mole from right to left and then the Stuka attacks on the right-hand side because you see that uh, that yeah. admiral or whatever look back to the right-hand side, and then suddenly this uh, the Spitfire who was gliding had no engine, had flaps down, makes I don't know an Immelman or something and shoots that guy down. It makes no sense, and that scene like it rips you out. It's a bad scene, no matter how you how you how you spin it, and it's it's you know it's it's like a black sheep in a crowd of uh, white sheep. Yeah, yeah, yeah. it just sticks out and it gives you that bad taste yeah in mouth because you think why 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 and Good especially too movie. too close to the end this is the problem yeah, too close to be the end. because then it, it it sticks more i mean to be a bit technical here isn't isn't the problem with shooting down a stuka in a dive also that he has the dive brakes engaged so if you follow him you will be certainly faster so the window of opportunity closes 
Uh, isn't this also a major problem that you will just pass by him? Uh, yeah. I mean, it just you know, sh shooting something at those speeds, uh, it's in, in the way, you know, I, it's possible. Of course, everything's possible in a sense. The way it was done, no. So um, I think there was a there was a very interesting comment from from Trauco. Um Let's take a step back and realize just how odd is how odd is it to have a movie about people running away and not the guys that actually fought and died. Well, in a way, I, I wouldn't call it running away. I think is. I think yeah, in in a way, but I think it's it's a, I would I wouldn't call it really running away so much, and I think are there other movies that deal with with retreats or evacuations in this way? We have um, that epic Napoleon three or four parter where he gets out of uh, out of uh, Russia that shows it quite significantly. Um, I mean, you have a couple of movies like. I don't know, could we call Stalingrad a movie like that? Yeah, I was thinking also about Stalingrad because you basically see them die in the end. So, yeah. so in a way, yeah, it's an interesting observation and, and definitely partially true. I mean, in, in a sense, you, you, you can ask the question, you know, why put so much emphasis on the people that are being evacuated and not the people that make it possible for these guys to be evacuated, i.e. Uh, the French and the British rearguard. Obviously, the British rearguard um, is, you know, is, is, uh, evacuates before the French do. Um, but you, you do have a nod to the French you know, at the very beginning yeah. and pretty much the last thing that happens in that movie, it says, we still have to get the French out. Yeah, yeah, yeah exactly. So, and I think, I, I don't know if it's actually said in the movie, but um, that also French transport plane, uh, planes are, are being used. And the very early, you know, the first scene essentially where you see the French, where, where that, you know, French officer says, you know, bon voyage, like have a good trip. Yeah. Um, it, it tells you everything. I think that, you know, it's one of the most powerful scenes during that movie and it's reserved to, to give homage to the French it held held a weird guard and it's in the very beginning and you can see them fighting off the germans that are advancing whereas then all the brits are already on on the beach and essentially quote unquote i don't want to step on anybody's toes here a toes here but say um they're not doing anything right um they know the french are there they know the french they are holding it so they're trying to get out um so in in, in a way I'm, I'm not too fussed about it um, I would have been very much upset if those scenes uh, where they involved the French were not in the movie. Then I would have been somewhat upset. And I say this as a German, you know, yeah. um, who <laughs> who has no affiliation to, to the French state, essentially. Um, <laughs> but uh, yeah, that, that's pretty much it. I mean, what, 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 what would be really great would be the, the scene, the quote they have, like in the, I think, the official um, report the British did after the war. Well, because they, they quote the last scene when, when, when they leave the French on the pier, which I think I added in, in my video to a certain degree. And this would, would probably have made the movie probably better in a way to giving a bigger nod to the French or also probably, I mean, making a sequel <laughs> and yeah. a, for showing the, the French side of the whole thing, because this would actually yeah. be really interesting to have this movie and and just some some key scenes where they overlap and create another one from the French perspective and maybe at some point also the German perspective right right in the that, far that, far future <laughs> no no I, I agree actually it, it might have been a very powerful ending if 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 you know there would have been that that honor guard of the French on, yeah. on the pier um, that would have probably been uh, but that is obviously after, is that after the Brits were evacuated or is that after everybody and the French were evacuated? I think this the was, the, I think this was the very last because I think he mentions that the, the French officers go on board, but the, the last French leave. So this is, I think, the, the very ending. Because it's like three days after the movie ends, essentially. Probably, yeah. Yeah. 
I th- it was a while, so I'm I'm not one hundred percent certain. So. Mm-hmm. So I think I think we I think we move to questions now, or or do you have anything else? No, so good. Mm-hmm. So I, I I will say one thing. Um, the the shot where the Spitfire is burning. And you see the Germans watching onto the dune. You see Tom Hardy in front of the Spitfire. Even though the Spitfire has no engine, it is one of the most beautiful shots I've ever seen in cinema. And I, had, I was just hoping that it would last like two seconds longer because it was beautiful. That's all I have to say. It was really, cinematography speaking, it was one of the best things I've ever seen. Nothing to add here. So please, if you had uh, enter questions or comments before, please re-enter them now because uh, we if you now scroll back we will miss everything so it's a good movie yeah we can highly recommend it i'll probably watch it a second time but i'm not entirely sure but maybe i will get it on dvd anyway i yeah, hope i hope they have a commentary track on the dvd because comment i i really started to love commentary tracks on movies this yeah, I, I I didn't like it at first, but then a couple of years ago, I bought that uh, massive um, uh, making of uh, compilation box with Lord of the Rings. So I watched uh, the director's cut, plus then I watched the 12 DVDs that explain how they made the movie, and then I watched the audio commentary. And I think to, together that is like 40 hours or, or uh, 50 hours of entertainment, and that's when I started loving uh, commentary. <laughs> Okay, there's the first question for me. What if Dunkirk failed? So if the evacuation at Dunkirk failed, I think Britain could still hold the war because there were, I think, enough soldiers on the island. The, pro- the problem is they were less trained, so Dunkirk, they were the most experienced. And I think the psychological shock would be a major issue because there was already a psychological shock from from the French breaking down so fast and everything going on. And then Dunkirk basically was a moral victory. So this wouldn't have happened. So this could have led to a very different situation. Of course, Churchill could have rescued it, but it would probably have been quite harder. So if Dunkirk had failed, this the second world War could have really gotten in a different direction. Because a ceasefire probably could have been possible over some other instances. So the next question is, um, could you recommend a good book about World War II from the German perspective? Or a German perspective? I mean, of course, there is the um, das Deutsche well, Reich und das... <laughs> what? Das Deutsche Reich und das Zweite... Ja, das Deutsche Reich und der Zweite Weltkrieg. But the problem is, um, it, it's 14 volumes and I think only around 10 volumes out in English and I think one volume in English costs more than in German and the German one costs around 50 euros so I think the English one is around f- around 100 bucks a piece so although the very early ones are already dated so um, I mean for for the Eastern Front or for Barbarossa basically not the whole Eastern Front I would I would say um, Stahel does a pretty good job with with Operation Barbarossa, I think, and he has another two or three, his Kiev and Moscow. So this is quite interesting. I mean, the came, I mean, probably the best way to do is go in a library, look for the Cambridge history of the Second World War, and then they have for every article in there, they have a bioglo- bibliographical essay at the end, which notes all the relevant uh, literature and discusses it shortly on this topic. And there's very likely that they say, okay, this is the best one on the German perspective or from the German side of the war. Because I, I mean, I have this, this major thing, the Deutsche Reich und der Zweite Weltkrieg, so I don't look for single volumes anymore because now I finally completed. I have all 14 parts and they cover everything. And for the stuff that's dated, I have the Cambridge history of the Second World War. And also Stahel and 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 um, someone sent me also a really great book about Barbarossa. I, I don't know the name right now, which which also goes very into has also very interesting aspects from German's perspective. But it's also again Barbarossa. So 
I think for the whole war, the German perspective, I don't know if there is a good one out there. So, um, will you do a full thing about red tears? I don't think so. Maybe, maybe, maybe on my, maybe on a new channel where I make fun of things. Yeah, this could be happen, happening. Yeah, I once considered it, and then I was like, no, that that stuff that doesn't come on my channel. <laughs> no. So what? Um, ah, there's one for both of us. Um, yeah, there's one of both for both of us, completely unrelated. But what can you? But can you have oh, that's that's the um, that's Irish city name? No, it's, uh, I think it's Welsh. Yeah, well, uh, or something. I think the Gohosh was pretty well known. Yeah, it's pretty close to what it's supposed to sound like. <laughs> so, uh, yeah, um, I have to apologize. I have to go. So I apologize for the off topic. Your favorite scene and or more 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 realistic air combat movie sequence oh, oh i i have no clue actually i'm i'm not that well into air combat that i can say when it's realistic or not i mean i i can recognize for instance a v formation i say oh it's but as bismarck noted okay they were actually flying a bit close or something i have no clue about that so so for me it's it's i have a general idea about most stuff but i i'm usually more on the strategic level and and how everything works together but less on the on the various details another one for me do you think it was a good idea to make the movie at the new town of dunkirk to be honest i have visited dunkirk and for me it was disturbing to see modern dunkirk town i i i i didn't have a problem with it because i didn't realize it at all i mean bismarck mentioned that that he that in the final shot or something that the yeah. town looked too modern I I have no recollection of that thinking of that in when I when I saw the scene. Maybe I was distracted from something else, but I may, maybe I was distracted from the bad Stuka scene. So, but I think actually I think that the flyover happened before that. So, I think I, I know I, I know what I noticed in the flyover. I looked at the flaps, and I was okay. My my God, the flaps are extended. Excellent, excellent. Yeah. So this is what I noticed, and and then, with that knowledge that he shot down the sugar, made even less sense. Okay, because yeah. if you're gliding and you have the flaps fully extended, this pretty much means you're you're rather slow. So so for me, it I didn't recognize it. It was not a major issue for me, but I can't tell for us. So for 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 Bismarck, it was. So well, I know how how the north of France looks like, so it immediately looked a little bit too modern to me. So but it, most people won't know that. So, how much air support did they actually get? Uh, I assume you mean the British Expeditionary Force. I I think I pass this on to Bismarck. Um, direct air support very little because the RAF was flying sorties outside of Dunkirk trying to intercept the bombers before they came, and rough it was roughly two hundred fifty to three hundred sorties a day. Um, and the Germans answered that uh, with their own fighters, plus additional uh, bomber and Stuka squadrons, of course, but not on all, or not on during all days. Um, so the best thing you can do if you want, you know, a more concrete idea of when the Germans attack and so on, is just to watch my video on it. I made it like a couple of like weeks ago. Yeah, it's uh, excellent. He is Luftwaffe failed uh, at Dunkirk. I think you have a pretty nice graphic on this everything yeah. which which really sets a new ground. So the chat is jumping today or again. I don't know how that okay, all right, thank you. Um at me would the Heinkel one hundred eleven have pulled off after the minor damage is sustained. It was burning and was very close to its target. Uh hard to tell, I think this sometimes really depends on the pilot because some pilots go for the kill, some go for, okay, I will try to save the plane. Some say, okay, I, I ditched the load, but I think, yeah, hard to tell. What is your view on this, Bismarck? We only know the external damage. We don't know the internal damage. Could have been that the pilots were hit. Could have been that some control lever was severed and it, the plane immediately pulled off. Um, could have been that there are 
there was some mal- malfunction in in the plane that the, the bombardier said like i don't get responses from the bombay doors or something you know um it all happens very convenient of course uh, overall the damage doesn't look that bad i mean it's venting uh fuel and um coolant uh, which usually is especially with coolant is a is a very potent reminder that you should go home as soon as possible because uh these engines will not hold up long if once the coolant is gone. However, the, as close as it happened to the ship, I would say that usually they would have continued with their attack. Maybe not be as accurate as before, but yeah. Yeah, when you basically over a ship, it's... So one question for me, what's your opinion on the little ship story? I've, I I think you referred to the little ship story in the movie. What I actually really loved, which I forgot in the movie, is that the Royal Navy is there and instructs them to take on the life vests. And then the Royal Navy uh, personally comes back and they board the other ships. And the little ship guys, the, the civilians, drive off on their own, which pretty much... Um, is along the lines which I read that most of the little ships were actually manned by the Royal Navy, but there were a few exceptions. So basically he shows, because I think you see two or three ships getting manned by the Royal Navy, he basically nods to the historical accuracy in the movie, but then goes with I would what I call the movie interpretation or the, the movie view. And this is also something which I know from a different movie which I really liked in this regard. It's Gladiator. Because in Gladiator you have Marco Mark Aurelius or Mark, Mark Aurel, I don't know how it's in English, which was the last emperor which adopted his successor. Uh, which, was a, a, would, which was an adopted successor. So Marco, uh, Marcus Aurelius actually was the first, again, who has his son take over the throne. But in the movie, he actually says, "Ah, oh, well, you will be not my successor. I will make, uh, I don't know how it's called, Russell Crowe my... And then he gets killed. And then he gets killed. So, so this is basically, the movie takes uh, some, some facts, some historical facts, or what we think, what happened, and then puts another interpretation on that. So that Marcus Aurelius, because he's a very um, well-viewed emperor was actually wise enough to see that his son was an insane person and wanted to avoid that, but gets killed by him. So, and I think the, the Little Ships is another great example for this, where you say, okay, you know, this is a movie, we rather show in this case civilians, or we go with the, with the less likely part, but we also nod to the historical fact because we did our homework. It's, for me, it's also, we did our homework because most people won't notice, th- won't notice that in relation, they would say, okay, there were some soldiers and the pr- uh, some Navy guys and they probably would miss it. The subconscious would notice, but they probably, it wouldn't stay in their consciousness. I mean, most people, if you ask them, yeah, where the little ships manned majority by the Navy or by normal people they would probably say normal people but if you for example go on the association and this is something you marked out in your video if you go to the uh, association of the little ships they clearly state on their website that most little ships were manned by the navy now of course i would presume also maybe it's also a marketing strategy in a little bit because if it had been primarily the May- navy maybe there would have been a little shit storm here in in, in the uk uh, because obviously that that it is somewhat of a potent myth that little ships were manned primarily by your typical, you know, John who who was a fisherman, um, uh, which is which, you know, was not true. Um, the end, you mostly when the little ships come, you mostly see them being the ones, you know, the civilians. Uh, it's it's probably also a nod to the fact, you know, it, yes, there were civilians there alongside with the Navy and alongside the ships that were impounded by the Navy or requisitioned rather than by the Navy. Um, but we we want to show that, you know, the civilians also went there even though they didn't have to. Um, so, you know, it, it, it works with me. So another question from David Wood. Are there any particularly World War II battles, campaigns you would like to see made into films now that Dunkirk is a success? So I, I would say I, I'm go more with I would like to see more 
movies that are done this way and I don't really care too much about the battle or campaign I would say I, I'm, I'm more about and, and not exactly like Dunkirk it could be also where you portray both sides or something but more on on this on this impression level or yeah it's it's more on less um, the hero stories more the the pain, the hopes, and the, dis the the despair, and everything more, more, more real and sober, and less boom boom. Probably you could do um, Corland evacuation, but you know, since that's the Germans, <laughs> I doubt it will happen. Yeah, I mean, also on the Eastern Front, it will always get um, rather rather dark or rather. Yeah. This is also the casino, maybe. Yeah, this, but it's supposed to, I mean, you, this would, oh yeah, this could be actually quite interesting, but it's, it's hard. Yeah. There's also a problematic with the, with the destruction of the, of the, of the monastery and everything. Yeah. So it's, it's a touchy subject basically everywhere. So, um, another question. Do you know if the British received an advance to the beaches or the head of the Belgian and French allies? I actually don't know. Do you know anything about this, Bismarck? Um, well, it, it makes sense in a way because the British were evacuating or were conducting the evacuation. Um, so if they received the order in advance b before the Belgians and the French, um, that would in a sense make sense because they could directly issue that order to the own um, to the own troops before going through the Leo zones. Um, now I have actually heard of this and, and I've read about it as well. And I can't remember if it said that this was actually a myth or not. This is this is where now I'm unclear. In, in my mind, it makes sense that this could potentially have happened, but I'm no longer sure if it's if it really happened or if it was a myth. I, I read about it, but I, I just can't place that right now. Yeah, that's always this this problem when you don't really focus and then it's mentioned that and that way. This is yeah. not a question for me. Have you ever seen the series Generation War in German Unsere Mütter, Unsere Väter? Actually, I haven't. I, I know a historian of mine who said actually it was quite good, but I don't remember in what sense. And I, I, I heard other people in the comments that actually spoke quite negatively about it. So I think they were mostly from Poland. So so I don't really know. And But I, I think I actually will check out if it's on DVD or something and then I will probably get it if it's not too much because actually this is something I should see and probably could also do a video on or at least be entertained in a way or appalled if it's really badly done. But I don't think so. Do you Did you see it, Bismarck? No. So I only know that a lot of people in Germany said it was bad and a lot of people outside of Germany said it was good. <laughs> That's quite interesting because the historian in Germany said it was good, but, but I think he said something along with a condition. It was good, f f like something because it, or, even though it was mainstream or something along those lines. So, mm. so um, lost track of the chat again. Here we go. Question: um, Will you make a video about the Latvian legionnaires who fought for the SS? I I will. I don't do videos on the SS. For for I think I have five reasons <laughs> listed on my frequently asked question. I mean, maybe at some point I I might do something. But one one point I think I don't have on the frequently asked question. The main problem with the SS is that there is a very you basically have there are some admirers out there who wrote books about them and then there are professionals but you have to be extremely careful what you write or say in any way about the SS yeah. so so the, the, so basically I assume that there are two types of titles out there the one that are overly cautious and probably negative out of out of basically fear to cover their ass and then the other that are just admirers and myths and, and blah blah so 
So you will already have an extremely polarized literature on, on this subject. Uh, I actually have literature on the Latvian Legion. Uh, and I can tell you um, if somebody makes a video about them, it's me. But that's for personal reasons. We'll talk about that later. <laughs> yeah. So, and, and the other thing is, of course, um, it will attract probably the wrong crowd from my channel, uh, both from both aisles of the, of, of the political side. And also, of course, demonetization. I, I only had three videos demonetized, but um, I probably for the SS, I had to do a lot of research. So I probably will have to spend at least 20 hours and then to get basically nothing out of it. And only trouble, mainly trouble, is totally not worth it. This, yeah, this is something you guys have to remember for us. This is, in a, in a sense, a job. You know, yeah. Our livelihood depends on our earnings and your support on Patreon, your support via Super Chat and donations and over our streams are amazing. And they help us being independent from YouTube to a certain degree. Yeah. But right now, we still don't have the support over those platforms that we could say, okay, we are not 100% or you know, we're not 80% dependent on our YouTube earnings to be able to pay our rent, pay our food, yeah. pay our internet connection, and keep our subscriptions alive that allow us to, to make these videos, right? Um, so, so right now, uh, a video that gets demonetized for us, it is like um, somebody at the end of the... Of the month uh, rips you know your paycheck out of out of uh, out of your hands and, and cuts it into pieces yeah it's bit like it's basically you go to work a whole month and suddenly um, your employer says um, for this and this day you don't get any money yeah and and you also don't know why because I'm I made free videos and I know why one is demonetized and it makes sense it's nuking the beaches but the other two that got demonetized was one out of war video which I have no clue why and the pronunciation video on steel division both these videos make absolutely no sense at all why they are demonetized because they contain nothing at all that is anywhere close to all the other stuff. I have way worse, in a way, videos on, on everything, on violence, on the war, on, on atrocities. Everything is mentioned something more. Nuking the beaches, I completely understand. It's nuclear war, it's biological war, it's chemical war. I mentioned this. Okay, I completely understand. But for the other two videos, I have no clue. And I also talked to I also talked to the guys at YouTube, and there will be no information on this. So, and as far as we know, it's an automated system anyway, which has become clear that the last two weeks more clear more information is is given there. So, it's it's a, a, a dangerous thing. And I recently saw the new Patreon video from ForgottenWeapons.com, and then I realized actually how much my content is still shackled in a way because I would probably do some other videos if I could and was completely independent from, from advertising money and I'm rethinking my strategy to a certain point because right now it's if I don't get the views I have a major problem for instance then I, I can't buy new books or I can't go to museums or do other stuff or I have to make more videos if I don't get the views of my videos so right now I'm focusing more on on making the videos more popular or more popular topics to a certain degree. Although I think other topics are more important. So for instance, this is one of the reasons why there will be probably no more logistics videos because, well, basically nobody watches them, but I think they are very important for understanding the whole thing about the war and understanding military history and everything. So in a, in a way I will yep. probably do some, but I have to repackage them or include them with some clever titles but this drains away energy because i can't just name a, a, a video logistics of the german army in russia but i have to give it a special name or something to get more attraction and and i actually i don't really like marketing and and making clever titles i'm more into making clever scripts and writing stuff on funny funny wordplay or some puns I, I really like that but about titles it's uh, it's packaging okay i don't i don't i don't package gifts usually i, I, I just <laughs> give them to people here you have right, this right. <laughs> so, so i think i think right. we we, sh we should move on yes uh, no but it's it's very important what uh, what uh, bernhard said guys um and and you know do t 
do in a way take it a little bit too hard what he said because that's how the situation is for us anyway next question for you uh, do you think that it was a bit odd that the 109 attempt to strafe the tiny civilian vessel? I can understand bom to bombard the ships, but that just seemed like an unnecessary risk. I mean, this is... It's hard to tell what, what's going on. I mean, for me, it's more like, yeah, unnecessary risk, for instance, going so low, also spending ammunition, because we have a very limited amount of ammunition. I mean, there is, I think, these works from Sönke Heinzel, who did interpret the various um, from from war um, confessions or basically the, the eavesdropped on, on prisons of war and he noted various instances I think where strafing against civilians happened or something but there are some people noted that he may have cherry picked them or that the those were actually um, boasting with something so I find it quite odd. We know that the Japanese did it for sure, as far as I know, but this was also um, quite more a racially charged front. I mean, on the Eastern Front, it's something different, but on the Western Front, it happens. It happens, but it's not the norm. Let's yeah. Just say that. It's, I, I, I did, for instance, I. I, I wasn't like, oh my God, that's, that's true, or uh, that's, that's a lie, or something. It was like, yeah. It's it's probably it probably happened. It's probably not something out of the ordinary. It's this is the thing with war crimes and the atrocities. For for me, it's like yeah, it's war. You send a lot of people in various conditions under various stresses. You send them against each other to kill each other. I mean, they happen crime all the time, even in peace. So what do you think is going to happen in war when the stress is way higher, everyone is trained to kill each other and everything else? So for me, there's also a reason why the, the whole war crimes compar comparing and everything, it's like, um, yeah, I think it doesn't serve, serve a major purpose. So Yeah, we, we have another question on this, actually. It's also directed to you. Um, all these aviation <laughs> questions are directed <laughs> to you. Uh, how accurate was the bombing of the mall and the coincidentally the Red Cross ship? Was that against the Geneva Convention before or after the war? If you want, I can take that over. Yeah, take that over, please. Okay, so um, I've been getting these comments as well on my video on Dunkirk and people getting upset that uh, the Germans were seen to do a quote-unquote war crime. Um, and this is uh, completely not what happened. So on, uh, it's actually what happened at Dunkirk. The the maid of Kent, I think the ship was called. She was a hospital ship was sunk at uh, at Dunkirk, and another hospital ship was damaged. However, here's the thing: these hospital ships, or these ships of mercy, essentially, when they carry civilians and wounded, are in a way it's hands off. You cannot touch them during war. Um, they are clearly marked, and for example, at night, I believe they are also they are lighted up, so you can clearly see them. However, as we know, during, throughout the war, mistakes happen either on purpose or accidentally. If it is done out of the air, it is usually by accident, because red crosses, even though they're huge, are very hard to spot from you know five thousand meters up or four thousand meters or even three thousand meters. It's extremely hard, and especially if the ship is full of men that essentially obstruct the rest crosses on the deck, you can't see those. Or um, the smoke from the smokestacks. Or the smoke for the smokestacks, for example. However, we know, for example, that a couple of ships that were uh, transporting civilians away from the Eastern Front, for, from Germany, from Kurland, over to Germany, were torpedoed on purpose by the Russians. And it, in fact, the greatest naval catastrophes happened on that side of the front. I think there's one ship, the, the Gustloff. Wilhelm, yeah, Wilhelm Gustloff, they had like 9,000 civilians and wounded that were killed because some Russian um, captain decided to torpedo it. And I think a week later, he torpedoed another one carrying 7,000 or something like that. Stuff like that happens either intentionally or unintentionally. Out of the air, it is usually done unintentionally. However, if such a ship does not carry only civilians or wounded and or wounded, but also unwounded soldiers, it is no longer covered under the Geneva Convention as far as I know. And this makes the Maid of Kent and the other hospital ship at Dunkirk somewhat iffy, whether it was against of, or um, in line with the rules of engagement. Um, I'm not a lawyer. I haven't studied. I have not studied, studied it. I've looked a little bit into it, obviously, and that is what I took away from it. We're not 100% sure how it falls into the 
into the law at that point. Anyway, next, uh, I think that's that's all I can really say about yeah. it. The next question. There's for me one. Do you think it's okay to sacrifice historic accuracy in order to improve a film? An example of this being the yellow paint on the Luftwaffe to draw them out. I think generally, I, I have a I have a very strict hierarchy for almost everything. For me, it's like, for instance, if you have a channel where you you have history in the name, or you say you make a video about historical stuff and it's educate it's on and the purpose is educating, then the imp historical accuracy is important. A movie is and will be ever is a fiction for me. If you do education and non-fiction, then Historical accuracy is very important to getting this, the, the, the facts straight. So for me, I, I usually don't have very much problem with historical accuracy in, in movies or games until it makes stuff worse sometimes. So in a way, I mean, in Fury, when, when, the, when the tiger drives out or something, which make, makes absolutely no sense, uh, it's more like, okay, I'm not, never going to watch the movie. So it's, 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 it's quite difficult in that sense that sometimes I care and sometimes I don't care. I mean, for Red Tails, I didn't care too much about this because as Bismarck noted, it was bullshit all the way. So this is also, I think there's, there's also this part um, on consistency. But in general, I would say I give way more leeway if, if it's um, fiction. And I don't give very much leeway if its purpose is education and especially if history or something is in the channel name or proclaimed to be made. I mean, there's a lot of people that usually bring the excuse, yeah, well, we just, um, we just make, want to make the youth or someone interested in history. And to this I can say, well, you could also read the Mein Kampf. They would also probably get interest in history or show triumph of the will. <laughs> this is the thing. Just um, the end doesn't justify the means. There are certain very instances where this happens, where the end justifies the means, but not on principle. This is where I have a clear, very clear stance on this. If it's education, if it's non-fiction, get the fucking facts right. Errors can happen, but yeah, there are examples out there which are basically a sequence of errors, um, hyperbole, or just to get the narrative across. If you want to get the narrative across, make a novel, make fiction out of it. I won't have a problem. But if you want to get the stuff right and then stick to the to the facts mostly and yeah, good. Um, we have that question already. Uh, I have one here for you. Uh, what is your thoughts on war movies being based too much on the on the strongholds of the Allies, USA? UK, USSR, and not instead on smaller countries or an access viewpoint. Um, can I quickly say something? Yeah, of course. Um, there are two good movies that I would um, advise everybody to watch in the chat that are based on Denmark. It's April 9th, I think, and then there is Land of Mine. Land of Mine I have not yet seen yet, but it is the demining uh, of the Dan Danish beaches done by Hitler Jugend kids after the war and uh, how the Danish army has done it. And it shows a small country and what happened in that small country. And both movies are very good. I've seen April the 9th and it does very well with little, just like Dunkirk. It's a good war movie in my opinion. And also thank you very much for that super chat donation, $20 by- From Sky Monster. Thank you very much, Sky, Sky Monster. Monster. Awesome, thank um, you very much indeed. I read it out. Um, thank you so much for your content. I have been watching for a long time. I even enjoyed the logistics video. Thank you very much. You even helped me to improve in flight sims. I understand how time consuming research is and hope this helps. This helps very much. Thank you very much. And we will, I will share it with Bismarck, of course. Are we share the donations, guys, on these streams. So um, about the war movies, um, the I mean, one thing is most stuff comes out of Hollywood. So, I, and actually, I mean, the, the EU actually does the wrong way. I mean, the thing is, I mean, this is quite interesting. I think this said, um, I think Denzel Washington said this. Or I think, or, or I think it was a black actor. And he said, um, when people want more people, it starts in the writer's room. So you need people that... I think he made the example, could Martin Scorsese make Schindler's List? Yeah, probably, but 
it make more sense that Steven Spielberg made it. And he, and he said Martin Scorsese doing, I think, Goodfellas made a sense. So in a way, basically, you need to await you have writers from these countries or they have a, a proper affiliation to them probably to get it right and good. And they also have to make it to, to, to Hollywood in a way. So, I mean, we have some actors like, I forgot his name, the guy who played the, the SS guy in, in, in... Christopher Lanz? Yeah. Oh, Christopher, yeah. Yeah, Waltz, Waltz, yeah. Waltz, Waltz. We, we have some famous actors, but so... I mean, that they're based on the strongest allies makes sense because it's always about making money. You should not forget this. Um, I know this very well from, from, the movie, uh, from, from my channel. For instance, um, I have a very large US audience, but funnily enough, all my German videos get way more views because it seems that most people that watch my channel are actually not interested in American stuff, but very much interested in the German and the Eastern Front. So this is also the reason why I do basically now more German stuff again, because I, I make a video about the American Expeditionary Force, which took 18 hours, and then I get around 20,000 views. So it's like, okay, nobody's really want to see that. So I do more stuff on the German side of things, which I also have far more literature anyway, and is also mostly in German. So it's, it's a benefit for everyone. In this case, it's not really a problem. But I think this is also the thing, you should not forget that the movie and also computer games are a huge financial investment. And they, they can make, I mean, this is also I think the reason why Sid Meier said it took so long to make Colonization 2 because his thought is that it's too focused on the US that's not interesting for the international market, although I think Colonization is one of the best games ever. So anyway. Um, there is there is one thing. Um, a lot of movies do get made on a national level and they never hit the international level. Yeah. So if, if there is any country you're interested in uh, to see a movie from them, just look it up on their national sites. Uh, so usually you find some information in, in English as well and you'll find a movie. And maybe it has English subtitles or something. So best you, you know, you can you can find a lot of movies that way. I think in Finland there is like a movie, Finnish movie, Winter War, which is very good. You you can find movies. Uh, maybe not Hollywood blockbusters, but you can find them. Um, there is one question here for you again: If you own any kind of real uh, World War artifacts or replicas, uh, he pers the person that asked us that 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 asked that. <laughs> He bought the MG-42 armor box. <laughs> so I only have replicas of field manuals right now. I got, I got a bunch recently and there should be more in the, in, in the, in the, in the shipping. And then video on Friday actually will cite of one of those that already arrived. Uh, about other stuff, basically I don't think, I think I had some, but I think I gave them away. I had some stuff from my, my grandfather, which then I gave to a relative, not, but replicas. Did I own at certain point one? I, I also don't think I owned one. I, I owned in the in the past. I owned model models like the, the Admiral Graf Spee, the the pocket battleship, but replicas. No, not really. It's it's also it's also the thing. If you have something like this in Austria or Germany, you basically. You basically everyone will think you are to the far right. So 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 it's it's it and I also don't have very much interest in it. I also right now I try to get some manuals and other stuff, and I usually want to get replicas. For first of all they're cheaper, and second of all I'm only interested in the content. So for me there's no uh, I'm not a collector anymore. I mean this is also because I, I collected so much stuff from heavy metal concerts like um, guitar picks and drumsticks and they just lie around. So for me, I don't have a, a personal attachment to material things for most of the time. I enjoy books because they're a better reading experience than on, than on the screen, but it's more of a practical thing and less of a material in a way thing. So basically no. It was a very long answer for a very short question. <laughs> So, um, is the chat stuck here? Oh. There is one question for me, what I would think about a movie about the fighting over Malta. Would be interesting, depends on how it's made. Um, I wouldn't say no, if it's done, in a, if it's done well. Uh, then there is a 
question for you a movie about the battle of saint louis bridge would be awesome don't you think nine french soldiers fighting five thousand italians for around 10 days and killing injuring 700 uh i'm not sure i'm out, huh? I, I i'm not sure how 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 this movie would go along currently with the current political situation okay because i think italy and france are on each other's throats already so i also think this i mean it could be done right for instance if it explains what actually happened because the thing is if you just leave the stats you will think that um that the italians just um sucked at this but i think there's probably a very good explanation why it happened and I'm not sure, I think I read about this, that these guys actually had breakfast together beforehand and then Mussolini just declared war and then they basically had to attack under complete bad circumstances. So it, so actually the, the movie, if you make it right and not some propaganda stuff, it could be either very revealing and interesting to show the strategy, the strategy and, and what happened or it could be go very wrong and basically seen as pure nas nationalistic propaganda. So... There's a couple of questions we've kind of already I, answered. I, I can't find the question you uh, read to me, that's the thing. Um, what, what do you think on the colonial soldiers on the beaches of Dunkirk and very shown accurately in the movie? The thing is... Um, I know the French had at least one division, I think I, uh, which is actually mentioned in one of my quotes in the video. But I've seen a few, I've, I've seen one video, I think, that complained that there were not enough colonial soldiers shown. And he noted there were around 1,000 to 1,800 Indians there. And I can say, well, uh, if you see how much people there were there and f I think 400,000 people, okay, let's say 300,000 people and 1,000 of 300,000 is, well, yeah, basically nothing. So, um, and I think they, they, they not, uh, not to it by, by, because that French soldier that gets with them on the boat, he has, he has sort of a slight colonial complexion i don't know where he comes from ethically speaking the actor but he has a s slight complexion so you might just say ah oh, that's them taking that into account yeah and but you know why why force this into the movie if it's unnecessary in a way and and i generally have i mean i remember when i was in 2006 i was in peru and and on the on the advertising stuff there were there were white blondes in some cases and i was like there are no people like that here what are you doing and the same, I, I react sometimes now when, when I see other stuff where I say, um, that's not an actual representation how, how it goes down here. So I'm a little <laughs> bit, I, you know, I, I don't have a problem with diversity. I have a problem if you force it down my throat. That's, that's basically it. And it will only backfire and it massively backfires right now. Right. There is a question about our opinion of Das Boot. I think it's great. I, I I never consciously watched it. I think I watched it once with my you girl. Have what? I, I watched it once with my, my, my girlfriend more than fifteen years ago, but since then I haven't well, had the time. You know you know what you will do after this stream and <laughs> no way you're not watching the release version, you're not watching the director's cut extended it, version. I think I have watched once the director's cut and was cut short or something. Yeah, but yeah, I, I at some point I will I will look it up and, and check with Generation War if I can get a good DVD with it. So, to to please our <laughs> to please Bismarck. <laughs> so well, not just the, please yourself. It's a great movie. Do, um, there is there's one question whether I have served in the German military. I have not. Uh, I enrolled in in, in matriculated university when I was uh, just um, seventeen. Uh, so I was uh, the German military said essentially we don't want you. And two years later, they abolished uh, conscription or a service um, required mandatory military training. Um, and so I never had to do it. And now they want to bring it back, which is, you know, very German. Yeah. So one question, we do you think the war would have been different if the Finnish effort focused on Murmansk instead of securing the North Lago? I, I don't know. I, I have to read up on this, but I, I would say probably no. Um, 
one for both of us. What is your thoughts on the old movies as Sahara made in 1943? Also watched Talihan Tala and then a video on it, please. Or was this one that you mentioned before? Did we oh, have sorry. this? Sorry. Did we have this question before? Which one? I ask you what, what is your thoughts on old war movies as Sahara made in 1943? No, we have not yet. But I've never seen Sahara. So I, I, I don't know about it. So I also have no clue about this. So here's so landmine just last week. There's um, a question. Who are better in the World War II? The Fallschirmjäger or the Bergsjäger? <laughs> they were trained for completely different circumstances. Yeah. You, you can't say like I mean, Gebirgsjäger yeah, will be very good in mountainous terrain. Well, that's that's a cheap way out. But uh, you know, both both are specialized units and both do well. I, and it's it's probably yeah. I think probably I think probably uh, Fallschirmjäger were trained more extensively. Yeah, probably. And and I think Gebirgsjäger. I don't know if Gebirgsjäger was um, a volunteer force. I think you probably were assigned to them. So, and I think mostly Bavarians and Austrians served in them. So, so one question you can probably answer the largest ship in Dunkirk or at Dunkirk. Um, there was a, as far as I remember, a light cruiser or a cruiser there on one of the days. Uh, I can't remember which one, what the name was. But after that, the largest ships, the largest civilian ships were around 6,000 to 7,000 tons. But the majority uh, were uh, around two thousand. Yeah, up, up and minus, you know, a thousand. So, um, and we are at the final question, I think. Um, will you do a video on the Yugoslav partisans? You probably mean in the Second World War, and it's an invitation to a lot of downloads. Yeah, uh, I know from the from the Great War Channel that they, I think, have at least at one Balkan video shut down the whole comment section and I think they did it on a second one and Flo always mentioned congratulations you did it again or something and I, I mean think they even mentioned they don't want to make one anymore yeah uh, like the Balkan area it's because of, of you know people that live in that region that can't watch a video so right. the, the whole problem is for instance ex-Yugoslavia in general because um, very close to home basically a lot of people living here um, then also I have some connections for instance the the museum in Buka, slovenia and also partisan warfare especially in second world war is basically war crime territory which also means be very careful what you say or you will get major problems in political sense in historical sense and also demonetization is waiting there so very very unlikely it could happen that there will be a short special or something when when something happens with Puka that maybe there's a collaboration or something going on because they cover it and and the funny thing is actually they mentioned in the that they had a partisan army there and it got actually tanks. This could be something that that get mentioned or we do something about it. So when something happens, it's probably in collaboration with them. And as special or something but it's also rather unlikely because i probably won't i uh, won't cover even the the yugoslav war but okay that's also very problematic and also close uh, close in time so uh, yeah extremely unlikely mm. so could it do a video on the current war yes very likely so um and there's a final one for bismarck what do you think of the german army Nit being shot, nit, not, being nicht, shot. not being shown till the end of Dunkirk. I think it was good because it gives that feeling of an enigmatic enemy that you don't know when he will strike. Yeah. In a sense. Um, I think it was good uh, because it, it, it just ups the scale a little bit and you never know when they will come up. You know, I mean, they take you completely off guard in the first scene. Then when they sit in the, then the Stukas, of course, come out of nowhere. Um, then the first air combat scenes come out of nowhere. Then they are in that boat and the sh those shots go into the boat out of nowhere. And then at the end, of course, you see the kind of shapes and so on. It's, I think it, it was, it was a good uh, decision, design decision um, that they, that they had. 
Right, so, I think that is all the questions. Awesome. Yeah, we finally managed it once. Even I, I went off the rails at least two times. <laughs> <laughs> so, so thank you very much, everyone, for watching and submitting questions, and especially for the donation from Sky Monster. And I would say, thank you, Bismarck. Thank you, Bernhard. So thank you for watching, and see you next time. Bye bye.